Howdy folks, welcome to module 2 of the CompTIA ITF Plus course, or should I say Information Technology Fundamentals course. Now, it's bigger, a bit of a mouthful, so I like to just say ITF Plus. Now folks, in today's module, we don't have that many units, in other words, subcategories we're going to be covering. Now that doesn't mean there's not a lot of content, there's still a lot of content in this specific module, if you'd like a more accurate idea of what's going to be covered in this video. Like usual, if you go look in the video description down below, you'll find a more accurate list of the topics discussed in this video, alongside of a couple of useful timestamps you can go and use if you want to jump ahead. Now, as for the agenda, only two units we're going to be covering, folks. The first one, using data types and units. I mean, that doesn't look like much, but trust me, there's a lot we're going to be covering there. CompTIA is a bit vague with the naming here. The second unit we'll be diving into is using apps. Also not much better than naming there, but hey, what can I say? That's CompTIA. So like I said earlier, if you want a more accurate list of what's going to be discussed in these units or in this module, have a peek in the video description down below, guys. It's way more accurate. It doesn't tell us everything we need to know, but it's way more accurate. It's got convenient little timestamps you can go make use of as well. All right, folks, if you haven't done it already, help support your homie by giving this video a like. Um, when you do that, obviously, YouTube will push this in front of more people, which means we get to help more people out there. Plus, you'll be helping me. I mean, why not? And if you find this content interesting, useful, or if you'd like to know when Module 3 comes out, possibly any of my other content, then maybe also consider subscribing, guys. Right, folks, with all the blah blah and formalities out of the way, I think let's go learn something. Alright folks, let's start with unit 1, using data types and units. The very first topic we're going to be talking about in this unit is something called decimal to binary conversion and then obviously vice versa, so literally doing that in reverse. So there's a lot to be said here, I'm going to try and keep this as simple as I possibly can without overwhelming anyone. So guys, if you don't know what decimal is, that is from 0 all the way to 9. So if I go and count 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to 9, those would be considered decimal numbers. Binary is 1s and zeros. Now things like computers, they work in binary. So there's going to be times you will need to know how to convert decimal to binary and then back, binary back to decimal. Uh, there's actually multiple ways you can go and do this. I'm going to show you guys one way to go and do that today. One of the easiest methods according to me. But I do encourage you to go and look for other methods out there. Maybe go look up a couple of YouTube videos or go hit a couple of manuals. I'm telling you now, there's always more than one way to get you answer when it comes to math. All right, so let's start at the basics. I'm going to start you guys off with an IP address. So guys, an IP address consists of four octets. Before you start wondering what the heck is an octet, guys, if there's an example of an IP address just on the right there, it's in green. So if you look at that IP address, there's four numbers. The 192, that's a number on its own, that's an octet. It's separated by a dot from the next number, which is a 168, the number in this case does not matter. So that's the second octet. The 15, that's the third octet, and the 7 would be the fourth octet. So there's four octets in a normal standard IP version 4 address. So we're not talking about the actual numbers there yet. We're just talking about the octets. There's four octets. All right, so let's take this a little step further. Each octet, remember there's four of them, consists of eight bits. Yeah, eight bits. Now, if you don't know what bits are, guys, bits is that binary we were just talking about a moment ago. So that would be the ones and zeros, putting it there for you guys in the bracket. So ones and zeros, that's binary. That's the bits. So each of those four octets consists of eight bits. All right, let's move on to the next point. An IP address consists of 32 bits in total. And you can probably see how I got to that now. Since there are four octets, each consisting of eight bits, eight bits multiply four gives you 32 bits in total. Now you might need to make a note of that because there's a pretty good chance they might ask you guys that in the exam. So it's 32 bits for an IP version 4 address. 
32 ones and zeros. But what exactly does these ones and zeros do? You know, besides the computer using them to figure out what numbers we're dealing with here and what letters we're dealing with. Well, guys, a one, in case you didn't know, means something is on. A zero means something is off. We don't count it. A one means that component or whatever it is is on, and we count it. Now, me just saying that on its own is probably not going to make much sense to you until you actually start seeing it firsthand. And it's going to start clicking, if I can put it that way. So I've got a bit of a table I want to show you guys. I'm going to clear this page up for a moment. There we go. There's a table. Now, unfortunately, I cannot take credit for this table. I wish I could say I designed it, but I did not. You will find this exact same table in many manuals. It's not just the IT Fundamentals manual. You'll find it in A+, N+. You know, mind you, you'll actually find this in many other vendors even. So never mind being not being able to tell you which course came up with this. I cannot even tell you which vendor came up with this table. I honestly have no idea. But whoever came up with this table, that guy deserves a beer because it really is one of the easiest ways. It, may, it might look intimidating and complicated. But using this table, guys, you'll very quickly see it's actually one of the easiest ways to convert from decimal to binary. And you can actually use the exact same table to go from binary to decimal, which is actually quicker in my opinion. All right, so I'm going to start you guys off, first of all, with a random IP. I'm going to kind of use the same one from earlier because why not? So the bottom in the middle, there's the IP address. 192.168.15.7. Now, how we're going to use this table is we're going to convert one of those four numbers at the bottom at a time. Unfortunately, we cannot convert all four of them at the, at the same time. So if you look at the table at the top and you count those numbers, you'll notice there's eight of them. Starting from the left at 128, going all the way to the right, there's eight numbers. Why? Because each of those octets has got eight bits. We're going to use this table to figure out what those eight bits are in each of these octets, which is why I'm saying you can only do one octet at a time. We're going to work them out one by one by one. All right. So starting with the first number, which is 192 in an IP address, I'm going to start at this table on the left, looking at the 128. So the first thing we want to do here is we're going to check, is that 128 smaller or equal to that first number? So remember, the first number is 192, folks. So 128, is that smaller or equal to 192? If it's smaller or equal, we're going to make a 1 underneath that 128. If it's bigger, then we're going to make a zero. Then nothing changes. We just move on to the next number. If it's a one, however, which it is in this case, in this case, 128 is in fact smaller than 192. We're going to make a one. Should it be a one, which it is, we're going to take the 128 and then we're going to subtract that from that number. So whatever that number above is, in this case, it's 128. We're going to subtract that from that first number in that first octet, which is 192. If we subtract that, what does it give us? It gives us 64. I'm going to put it here at the bottom left as a, I suppose we can call it a bookmark or a little scribble scribble. So that's my new number. So every time you get a one, like we did, we subtract and then you're going to get a new number. But should you get a zero, nothing happens and you move on. So my new number, folks, is 64. Now using 64, I'm going to go back to the table to the second block, which is also coincidentally 64. So. Is 64 smaller or equal to 64? Well, it's equal. Since it's equal, we're going to get another one. Since we get another one, we're going to take that number above the table and we're going to subtract it from that number that I've got in pink at the bottom. What is that going to give us, folks? Zero. Now, from this point forward, you can probably guess what the remaining bits are going to be here, you know, considering that they have to be smaller or equal, you know, kind of deal. So look, using that new number, which is not pink, it's zero. So my number is currently on zero now, folks. If I go to 32, is 32 smaller or equal? No, it's bigger. So it's going to be a zero. And if you look at all the remaining numbers, even the very last one being number one, it's going to be bigger. So every time it's bigger, it's going to be a zero. So moving on to 16, is it smaller or equal? No, it's bigger. So it's a zero. Moving on to eight, is it smaller or equal? No, it's bigger. So that's going to stay as zero. Moving on to number four on the right. Is it smaller or equal? No, it's unfortunately bigger. So that's going to be a zero, guys. The number two on the right. Is it smaller or equal? Nope, still bigger. It's going to be a zero. 
And the last one, that number one, is it smaller or equal? No, it's bigger. So there we go. We've got two ones on the left, followed by six zeros on the right. We have just successfully converted that first octet to its binary form, folks. So I'm going to put it as a reminder here at the bottom left in green. So there we go. Double one, double zero, quadruple zero. There we go. I'm going to leave that as a reminder there. And every time we convert one of these four octets, I'm going to just keep adding them there at the bottom until we've got the whole IP version four address in its binary form. And once we've done that, I'm going to go and do it in the exact opposite. We're going to go and do it in reverse. All right, so let's clear this whole table up again for you folks. Now, looking at the second number in that IP address at the bottom in the middle, that second number is 168. We're going to do the exact same procedure as earlier, folks. So using 168, let's start on the left of that table. Is 128 smaller or equal to 168? Yes, it's smaller. So that's going to be a 1. What happens if it's a 1? We subtract that 128 from the 168. And I'm going to put it here at the bottom left, that new number. It's going to be 40. So I'm putting it there in pink for you guys as a little reminder. Probably didn't have to do that, but it's going to help you guys understand this if I put it on the screen. So my new number is 40. Moving on to that second number in the table, which is 64. Is 64 smaller or equal to 40? No, it's bigger. So it's a zero, which means nothing happens to that 40. It stays the same. Moving on to the third number in that table, 32. Is that smaller or equal to 40? Yes, it's smaller. So we're going to get a 1. If it's a 1, something's going to happen. What happens? 32 is going to get subtracted from that 40, which we had previously. What's my new number that's left? 8. Now using my new number 8, I'm going to go to the fourth number in that table, which is 16. Is 16 smaller or equal to 8? No, it's bigger than 8, so that's going to be a 0. Moving on to the fifth number of the table, which is 8. Is 8 smaller or equal to 8? It is equal. So we've got a 1. What happens if it's a 1? We subtract. So we subtract 8 from 8, which gives us 0. And as soon as you hit 0, you automatically know everything else in this table is going to be 0. So looking at the third last one on that table, is 4 smaller or equal to 0? No, it's bigger. So that's a 0. Looking at that 2 on the table, is that smaller or equal? Nope, it's bigger. So that's a 0 on the table. Looking at the last one on the table, that number 1, is it smaller or equal? Nope, it is bigger. So once again, guys, there we've got the full number in the table now in binary form. I'm going to add it in a different color for you guys here at the bottom. Let's use red. So there we go. It's 10, 10, and then 1,000. You know, it's probably not going to be pronounced like that, but you can see it's a 1, 0, 1, 0. 1 triple zero. So that is half of the IP address done now. All right, let's move on to the third octet, which was 15. So we're going to start up a clean slate here, folks. Starting at 15, I think you guys can probably already see what's going to happen in the first couple of numbers. They're all going to be zero because all those first numbers in the table are bigger than 15. So you're only going to get a one if that number in the table is smaller or equal to 15. Now I can already see the first four numbers are all bigger than 15. So I can already guarantee you the first four, the first four numbers, they're all going to be zero. But we've got to go through this whole thing to really reinforce it in your head. So starting at the first one, is 128 smaller or equal to 15? Nope, it's bigger. So that's a zero. 64, that's bigger. So that's going to be a zero. Looking at 32, that's also bigger than 15. So that's a zero. Nothing changes if it's a zero. 16, is that bigger? Yep, also bigger, so nothing changes. It's going to stay a zero. Now, finally, we're starting to get to some numbers might, which might possibly be small or equal. So looking at the fourth last one, which is number 8. Is 8 smaller or equal to 15? Yes, finally, that one is actually smaller than 15. So we're going to put a 1 there. What happens if it's a 1? We subtract that number on the table from that value. So 8 is going to be subtracted from 15 which gives us the new number of 7. I'm going to add it to the bottom left here in pink for you guys as a reminder. So my new number is 7. Using that new number 7, going to number 4 on the table, is 4 smaller or equal to 7? It is smaller, yes. So we're going to put a 1. Now we subtract 4 from 7 since it's a 1. And what does that give us? 3. So I'm going to put a new pink number there below 7. It's a new number is 3. Using my new number pink, my new pink number 3 there, I'm going to go to the second last one on the table, which is number 2. 
So is number two smaller or equal than number three? Yep, it's smaller. So that gives us a one. Like usual, we're going to subtract that two from that three now, which gives us our new pink number, which is number one. And then lastly, folks, on the last one on the table, is one smaller or equal to one? Well, it's equal. So that gives us a one. So that's our number, guys. Four zeros followed by four ones. Like usual, I'm going to add it at the bottom for you guys in a different color. So there you guys go. In purple, four zeros, four ones. We have just converted the first three octets of that IP address. Now, the last one, considering you guys have probably seen now how this thing works, I'm pretty sure you guys can guess what the last one is without us even working it out. But just to reinforce this and to make sure that I've actually covered it, I'm going to do the last one of you guys as well. All right, guys, on to the last number on that IP address. That's number seven. Okay, so starting of the table again, starting on the left of 128, we're looking for numbers that's smaller or equal to seven. So 128, obviously that's bigger than seven, so it's going to be a zero. We're not even going to bother. We can see 128 is bigger than seven, so that's a zero. It's not smaller or equal. The next number on the table is 64. Is that smaller or equal? Nope. So that's a zero. 32. That's also bigger than seven. So that's a zero. Looking at 16 on the table. That's also bigger than seven. So that's going to be a zero. We're only going to stop once we hit something that's smaller or equal than seven. Looking at eight, which is where we previously stopped with the previous number. Eight. Is that smaller or equal? Nope. Still bigger. So even that one is still a zero. Now, finally, we're getting to a section where we might start getting some ones. So looking at that number four on the table, is that smaller or equal than the number seven? Yes, finally, that's a number that's actually smaller. So we're going to put a one there, guys. And now we're going to take that four on that table. We're going to subtract it from that number seven, which just gives us three. So I'm going to put it in the bottom left. There's the number three in pink. Now, using that new number now, the number three, which is in pink, Going back to my table, looking at the number two. Is number two smaller or equal than the number three? Yes, smaller. So that's a one. Last number on the table, that's going to be a one equals one. Because if you look at the number two we had previously, we would have subtract that number two from the three, which gives us one. You can see there it's in pink at the bottom. And um, on the right, is one smaller or equal than one? It is equal. So that's a one. So lastly, guys, there is the last one in blue in the table for you guys in binary form. Five zeros followed by three ones. And then like usual, I'm going to add a few guys at the bottom. So we've got the full IP address in binary form. I'm going to add a few guys in pink. Five zeros followed by three ones at the bottom. So there we go. All four octets, the green, the red, the purple, and the pink, all four octets have been converted to binary. Now, it seemed a bit long maybe while watching this video because I was obviously doing this in slow motion because I've got to explain this to you guys. But in real life, folks, it's actually a heck of a lot faster than that. It's really zippity, zippity, zip. It's quick, quick, quick. And to go from binary to decimal, believe it or not, in my opinion, is actually even quicker and easier. I stand to be correct. I mean, you're welcome to let me know in the comments down below what you, what you think of this. Um, let me know which one was easier for you to go from decimal to binary or from binary to decimal. Please let me know. Um, you don't have to. I'm just curious. For me personally, it's easier to go from the binary to decimal. It's a heck of a lot easier. And you'll see in a moment why I say that. All right. So I think to start things off, folks, let's first give you a random, random binary number. So what I'm going to do is I think I'm just going to take totally random ones and zeros. I'm going to add it as a pink number at the bottom left there for you guys. So one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. I literally just took random ones and zeros, as you guys can see, they're totally, totally, totally random. Now, what we're going to do here, guys, is we're going to take that number. That's actually just one octet. So if you had four octets, you would literally just go and do this four times over. So I'm going to take that octet, and I'm going to only count the ones. So using the table I've got above, those ones, I'm going to go and add them into that table, and I'm only going to count the numbers that's turned on. So you can go and add that. If you look at that first number in that binary, the first one is a 1. So that would go under the 128. The second number is a 0. So that would have gone under the 64. But since it's a 0, it's off. We don't actually need to count that. We only need to count the ones that's on. So what I mean by that is I'm going to take the ones in that binary. And I'm going to add it here into the table. There we go. 
So if you look at the binary number at the bottom, that pink number, you can see it's basically every second number that's a 1. Every second one is turned on. So the first one is a 128. Um, the second one that's that I see in that binary is the 32. The third one is the 8. And the fourth and the last one seems to be the one that falls over the number 2. All the other ones would have been 0, which is why I didn't even bother adding them to this table. You can if you want to, but you don't need to. Okay, so now that we've got all the ones in this table, you're specifically going to go look for how many ones they are, where they are, and you're only going to add those to the table. Now that I've got the ones in this table, look at the numbers above those ones. I need you guys to go and add those up. That's literally it. So how this is going to look is, I'm going to add it here for you guys at the bottom. There we go. So it's 128 plus 32 plus 8 plus 2. That's the numbers that's now got a 1 underneath them, which means they're turned on. That's the numbers we're going to add up together. That gives us what? It gives us 170. So if that was an octet, which was in binary form, folks, that's how you would have converted it to decimal, which was actually a heck of a lot quicker and a heck of a lot easier, in my opinion. It all depends on how quickly you can go and add up. But if you can add up quickly, or if you've got a calculator next to you, this is going to be lightning fast. You literally just take the four octets one at a time, you go take the ones in that octet, you add it to this table, you only count the numbers that's turned on, and ta-da, you would have the decimal number of that octet. It really is that quick and easy. Now, folks, before we move any further, I just want to mention it again. I did mention it earlier. There is more than one way to convert from decimal to binary, and the same can be said from binary to decimal. There's literally more than one way. I'm telling you now, if you go run a Google search or a Bing search or you go on YouTube, it, you're going to find there's probably like 10 or 20 different ways. It's basic math, guys. And you probably would have seen in school, if you had maths in school, that there's always more than one way to get your answer. Some of these methods are long, some of them are short, some of them are difficult, some of them are easy. Now, the table I showed to you guys today is generally what is easier for people. I've taught this more times than I can count in my life. And from what I've seen with my students, this seems to be the method that people understand a little bit easier compared to some of the other methods I would normally show people. So I basically just went and checked okay, which method is easier. And that's the one I decided to show to you guys in this video. So I hope this helps you guys out. And um, yeah, guys, I think let's move on to the next topic. We're wasting too much time here. The next topic in this unit is security control. So this is an entirely different topic in this unit now. So this topic, guys, controls come in different types and classifications. So controls is not necessarily something specific. It's a very wide net we're casting here. It can actually mean a lot of things. It's quite vague. So to give you a bit of a ballpark idea of what the heck CompTIA is talking about here when they say security controls, you'll see it's not just security, technically. The first thing is backup. I mean, I suppose you could swing backups as security, but in my opinion, that's more to make sure you don't lose stuff. So I suppose you could say that's security. It is, but it's not. But it is a form of security control. So a backup. So in other words, backing up your data on your own personal machine, backing up data on a server for everybody, you know, backups. Then you've got what we call access control. So allowing users or, you know, computers or machinery access to certain things. Now, this is coming at it more from a user perspective. So we're going to keep it to a user perspective. If we talk about access control from a user perspective, like giving certain people access to certain things, this could be physical access. This could be digital access. Now, looking at this, I'm going to assume it's digital access because ITF is definitely not that advanced, guys. So this is going to be digital access, but just know in real life, access control can also be physical access. That is something that gets discussed in A+. So if you guys decide to go and take CompTIA a little bit further, and after you obtain your ITF Plus certification, maybe go look at the A+, Plus certification, because this topic actually goes a little bit deeper in the A+, Plus certification. There we also talk about physical access control, never mind digital access control. So coming at this from a user perspective, coming at it from a digital perspective, access control could be something like permissions. I suppose some folks would call this privilege. It could also be usage restrictions. So who can use what, when, where, and why? It could be data encryption. Now that really does seem and sound like security to me. So it could be like BitLocker encryption, could be EFS encryption, it can be many, many kinds of encryption. Folks, you get many kinds of encryption in life. 
And then the last one I'm going to throw for you guys here under access control is something called firewalls. Firewalls can be found in a digital form as well as a physical form. So if it's on your own personal machine or a very small company, we normally call these small office home office environments, then it's probably going to be a digital firewall. You know, it could be one you've installed. Maybe you've only got a traditional Windows firewall installed on your PC, which is nowadays known as Windows Defender. Or if you've got a medium-sized company or potentially even a large-sized company, then you tend to want to have what we call a physical firewall. Have you ever seen what a router or a switch looks like? Some people call it a router. Some people call it a router. Depending on which country you're from, you might pronounce it differently. So if you've ever seen a big router, those big ones in the company, not the small ones, or if you've seen a decent-sized switch in a server room or a network cabinet, well, guys, a firewall looks very similar to that at first glance. You might even think it is a router or a switch at first glance, but if you look very closely, you'll see, nope, this device looks a little different. Something is different about this device. It's a firewall. They come in many brands, many makes, many models. So on average, guys, these things are not cheap. I'm not going to lie. I used to install these all the time for the government as well as the private sector in my country. And um, let me tell you, on average, even the cheapest ones are not cheap. They're stupid expenses, some of these things. But the amount of benefits you get of these firewalls is just wow. It's really, really worth it. And it's it's money well spent. Let me put it that way. At the end of the day, the amount of money it's going to save you in the form of damages, it's totally worth it. You want a physical firewall. So if you can at all afford one in your company, if you don't have one yet, guys, I'm going to encourage you to go and get yourself one or to, for you to go and tell your employer to go and get one because it's really going to help you avoid any potential threats in the future. A lot of issues in the future. Let me put it that way. All right, now moving out of the access control um, topic here, still under security controls though, the last one I want to add here for you folks before we move on to the next topic is high availability. So that is to make sure something is always available. This could be a lot of things. If it's, for example, a server, that server should never be offline. You need to have two of that server, two identical servers. So if the one goes offline for whatever reason, maybe it crashes, maybe it's down for maintenance, troubleshooting, whatever, maybe it's due for an upgrade, then the remaining server should carry on, carry on rendering whatever service that server was rendering. That's the idea. If you have one server, which is not a good idea, you know, you never should put all your eggs in one basket. But if you have one server, a good idea would be to put more than one network card, which is the same, and to put more than one internet connection, and more than one switch, you know, you double up on anything and everything wherever you possibly can, including the server. The problem with the servers is it's not always as easy as it sounds, and it's definitely not as cheap as it sounds. It can be very expensive very quickly. But a lot of companies, especially medium to large size, if they can afford it, you'll find they will double up on all their servers, if not even more. Maybe they'll have three or even four of the exact same server. So that allows them to do things like load balancing, never mind high availability, but that's not a topic that's discussed here right now. At the moment, we're discussing high availability, which means whatever service is being rendered, assuming it's a service, it should never be unavailable if something happens. Hence the name, high availability. All right, folks, moving on to the next section, intellectual property. All right, so some of you guys might have a bit of an idea of what this is already, since it's something that's not necessarily unique to IT. So intellectual property basically comes down to, in a nutshell, when something is your property or someone else's property. And uh, also comes down to people not trying to steal one another's ideas or their property and whatnot. It's a little bit more than that. Obviously, you get different categories. There's a lot more to it. So with that in mind, let's start off with copyright. What is copyright? Well, guys, copyright is automatically granted for an offer. So if you made something, kind of like me making these YouTube videos that I just made, this means that this video is now automatically copyrighted because I am the author of this video. Now, whether it be a picture, a video, or, you know, quite frankly, anything else in real life, if you are the author of something, generally that automatically grants you copyright of that, well, whatever that something might be, that item, whether it be digital or physical. Now, under the copyright topic, I'm also going to say here, it applies to whole works, not ideas. So just because you've got an idea does not mean it's copyrighted. So that's when you're going to have to go at and patent something. I think that's how you pronounce it. 
Uh, apologies for my pronunciation. I'm not actually English. So if I pronounce things weird, it's because I don't speak English. So if I pronounce something weird, it's generally just because, well, English is not my first language. Anyway, so like I said, under the copyright topic, this applies to whole actual works when you actually made something in most cases. Let me put it that way. Not when it's just an idea. So if you have a pretty good idea and you don't want this idea to be stolen by someone or a company, then you're going to have to go and patent it, which is something that's going to come up in just a couple of moments. All right, so before we talk about patent, trademark. What is that? This is normally more for companies. So a company's name and logo are protected if distinctive. So if a company has a distinctive name or logo, that's protected. You're going to have to generally go and ask that company's permission to use their name or logo in some sort of way. Um, there may or may not be some fees involved in if you do that. Also, companies can apply to register their trademarks if need be. And then finally, folks, we're moving on to that topic I just mentioned a couple of moments ago, patent. And I'm really hoping I'm not butchering the name of this thing. So patent, this is legal protection for an invention or a design, or in some cases, even an idea. You can go and patent it. So even if you have not actually gone and made this item yet, if you've got a patent on it, that means someone else cannot go and do it because they've got to go and pay you for the rights to that then. They've got to go and pay you some sort of fee and then they can go and make copies of this or use it or something. But as long as you've got the patent on something, people can't just go and willingly go and do that same thing again because, well, you can sue them in some cases. I think in most cases you can sue them. Also under patent, what I'm going to mention is must be original, must be useful and must be distinctive. I've known many people over my life that's designed something or they made something and when they want to go and patent it so other people can't steal it, they're unsuccessful because someone has either already stolen the idea, which is not that common, or someone else has already made something that's too similar to what you have. If it's too similar, it's not going to go through because it's going to look like you're trying to copycat them and you're like you're trying to steal their idea. Even though you really did, you really maybe did have your own a unique idea, which just happens to be very similar to someone else. Unfortunately, that is going to stop you as well. And then lastly, guys, under patent must be applied for in different jurisdictions. So if you uh, move to different countries or different states or so, there is a chance that you might have to go and reapply for it. It might only be valid in certain states or certain countries. So you might want to double check that. If you are going to go and patent something, just make sure that it's not just in one area, but it also covers the other areas if it's needed to be covered in other areas. And in most cases, from what I've seen, people want their stuff to be protected everywhere, not just in a small area. All right, folks, so that actually brings us to the end of the first unit, being unit one. Before we move on to unit two, there's a bit of a game I like to play with people on my videos. This is purely just for fun and gags, and it's only for the people that actually watch the videos up until this point. So if you're still watching this video up until this point, you can play along in a comment section down below. You can either use the word cheeseburger or you can make a creative sentence with the word cheeseburger. Now you might wonder, but why? Well, for anyone who's just randomly reading for the comments in the beginning of the video, they're going to have no idea what's going on. They'll be like, why is the word cheeseburger all over the comments? Why is everybody talking about cheeseburgers or this or that? It confuses them. It's just for giggles. Uh, but if you have any valid questions, you're also allowed to go and ask that in the comment section down below. So the comment section is not just for this giggle joke of mine it's also for valid questions if you've got any valid question about something that was discussed in this specific video by all means ask it down below and i'll get back to you as quickly as i possibly can i normally get back to people normally within about a day or two sometimes in a matter of hours depending on if i'm online or not but if you guys want to play along with this game use the word cheeseburger down below just don't do any swearing stick to the youtube rules otherwise the youtube police is going to be on our case and let's have some fun of this all right guys and if you haven't done it Please remember to give this video a like, remember, help your homie out. And I think on that note, let's move on to unit two, which is using apps. So you guys can probably guess that unit two is going to be a lot about apps. So the first topic in unit two, which is obviously about apps, is about installing applications. So this will be installing applications, apps, software programs. Guys, I'm not sure if you've seen, but you actually get many, many kinds of software these days. And you can find them in many ways. You can deploy them and install them in many ways. One of your oldest kind of applications you get, which is not something you guys need to know in this course, is Win32 apps. Some people call it Windows32 apps. 
That's a traditional application. You would go and install via CD or a DVD. You launch it, you click next, you click an install, or you went and downloaded it online, you click an install, next. That's one of the oldest kind of applications you get. You also get Windows Store applications, which are actually being discontinued. So it's probably pointless to mention that because Microsoft's getting rid of the Microsoft Store. Yep, in case you didn't know it, it's going to disappear. Not something you need to know. You get lots of cloud-based software nowadays as well, which is actually one of the more popular options. Almost everything is moving into the clouds and becoming remote. So many times when you run an application these days, it's actually not installed on your device or even running on your device. It's just displaying on your device via something like the internet. So that is something we call cloud, more specifically public cloud, and even more specifically software as a service cloud. Not something you need to know yet at this point in time. But if you find that interesting, feel free to go have a look at the A-plus course, which is also on my channel. A-plus does cover that. But if you plan on writing the exam for this course, maybe finish this course first. And if you eventually pass the ITF-plus exam, then go have a look at A-plus. Maybe even go have a look at N-plus, maybe even after that. Who knows? All depends on how far you guys want to push your IT careers. All right, so also something I want to mention regarding installing applications, this is part of the course, is software installation best practices. There's a couple of, I suppose you can call them rules. They are, but they're not. First thing is compatibility with the operating system. So before you go and willy-nilly buy an application or a software or download it, or before you try and install it for yourself or a customer or a user, you might want to double check if that application is actually compatible with that computer more specifically the operating system on that computer. Maybe what you want to install or what you're about to install only works on Windows 10 and something older than Windows 10. But the operating system you're trying to install it on is maybe Windows 11. So you might want to just double check that that program is in fact compatible before you go ahead. You also want to go and check system requirements. In other words, hardware folks. Some programs are quite resource intensive. They require the computer to have a lot of RAM perhaps, a lot of free space on the hard drive, maybe a very strong beefed up CPU. Now generally on the average day-to-day -day programs, you'll probably be fine. You can just kind of wing it and hope for the best and it's probably going to work. But there are odd occasions where some programs are actually very resource hungry. They're going to need a lot of RAM. Maybe that program requires the machine to have four gigs of RAM or more. And this machine you're trying to install it on only has two gigs or less. That's going to be a problem. It's going to prevent that program from launching. It might actually cause the PC to encounter an error or just completely crash for that matter. Other things you might want to check, not always compulsory, depends on your experience, is installation instructions. So if you've got a lot of experience, then maybe you can skip that step. But if you're still new to IT and if you're still very new to that specific application you're trying to install, you might want to go and check the installation instructions. Maybe there's certain things you need to know, certain prerequisites that's maybe not mentioned. So maybe there's certain settings you need to go and pre-configure first or anything like that before you install this program. Something the average IT guy would not, know, would not have known about. Something that maybe even I don't know about. Every program is unique in its own way after all. Lastly, folks, probably one of the most important things here, licensing. Some programs are free. We're going to talk about this in this module, later in this module. They're completely free. Some of them are free, but only for a limited period. You know, we call those trials in most cases. You can only test them for like 30 days. Sometimes it's not a time period, it's a usage um, limitation. So it'll limit you to only using it once or twice or three times, and it's going to cut out, it's going to stop working. But there's normally some sort of limitation on it. We call that shareware. And then you get open source programs and all that as well. So it's always a good idea to make sure that this program you're about to install, check if it's got any licensing requirements. Maybe you need a license for it. Maybe it's for the whole company. You need one license and then you sort it. That's like a company-based license. Other times you need a per user license. So that's a user-based license. Every user in that company might need a license and it can very quickly get very expensive. This is something you did not plan for. It could be that maybe you're lucky. Maybe there's specials, maybe it's free, but either way, you need to go and check the licensing. If it turns out to be too expensive, maybe go look at alternative programs. Maybe there's other ones on the market that does the exact same thing, which is cheaper or maybe even free for all you know. Alrighty folks, the next topic is configuring application compatibility. So what does that mean? It means, should you find yourself in a pickle of a situation where you've got an application which is not compatible with the operating system on which you're trying to run it, well, this might save you. 
All right, so guys, what it's going to look like is there's a bit of a screenshot for you guys. So if you have just installed a new game or a new program on a machine, and you know for a fact this game or program worked on a previous version of Windows, and you're trying to run it on this version of Windows, well, what you can go and try and do in that situation is you can go and right-click on that program's icon or the game, right-click on the icon, go to the bottom option uh, in the menu that opens up, that's going to be Properties, and on the Properties menu, you're going to go to the Compatibility tab, like you see there on the right in that screenshot. Once you get to the right-hand side, when you get to the Compatibility tab, there you basically go and choose, or at least this is the idea behind this, you go and choose the operating system on which you know for a fact this program or this game previously worked. So if you're trying to install this, let's say, on Windows 11, and it does not want to work, but you know for a fact it used to work on Windows 10 or Windows 7 or Windows 8 or one of those operating systems. Well, the idea then here is in that little drop down list you guys see there in the screenshot, it's under the little section that says compatibility mode. Currently, it's you can see it's disabled because it has not been chosen yet. But if you go tick that box, the button that says run this program in compatibility mode 4, that drop down list becomes enabled. And in that list, you can go and choose from a long list of previous Windows versions. And um, if you know, for example, this worked on Windows 10, the idea is for you to go and choose Windows 10 in that list. You then click on Apply, and then OK. And what's going to happen now is, the next time you double-click the icon of that game or that program, the idea is it needs to then run as if it's running on that other operating system. So even though you're launching it on Windows 11, or whatever operating system you're running this on, it's going to run as if it's running on that other operating system which you've chosen that compatibility list. Now, from the Microsoft side of things, I know this is a CompTIA course, but this is a Microsoft initiative. From Microsoft, they say this will work. I can tell you guys from experience, this does not always work. You've got about a 50-50 shot. It might work, it might not work. At the end of the day, if the program or the game already does not work, then you've got nothing to lose and you only have something to gain. So you've got absolutely nothing to lose by trying this. And if it works, then well, there you go. You're going to solve the problem very quickly and very easily. If it does not work, you're going to, then you're going to have to go to, unfortunately, to some other method, which is going to take probably a little bit longer, which is probably going to be a little bit more complicated. All right, guys, and then I'm going to move you on to the topic of repairing and uninstalling software. So when it comes to installing software, we mentioned that briefly earlier, there are many ways you can go about doing that. But what if you find yourself in a sticky situation where you need to go and uninstall a software or even repair it? Now, repairing software is definitely not something you guys are going to be doing very often, but uninstalling software, yes, that is something I find myself needing to do all the time. So one of many ways to go and do that, guys, is to go into your control panel, if you know what that is. So if you don't know what that is, go to your search on your machine, go type in control panel. At the moment, it still does exist. You go in there. Once you've gotten to your control panel, you're going to go to Programs and Features. Once you go into Programs and Features, you're going to see the screenshot we see in front of us. Now, this one's taken quite some time ago, but at least it does still look exactly the same when you guys go in there. Um, obviously, you're going to be seeing different programs and games and stuff installed on that particular machine you're going to be doing this on. Now, if you want to go and uninstall a game or a program, and it's pesky and you just can't seem to find the Uninstall button, this is probably the easiest and the quickest way to go about doing it. So you simply click on the program or the game on this list that you want to go and uninstall. Once you select the program or game, you're going to see an uninstall button is going to appear. You can click on that and it's going to uninstall for you quite quickly. Now something else that can also be done on this very same screen is you can go and use this to repair a program. Sometimes it can even be used to change a program. Now that's not in the title for this course, but I'm putting it out there if you need to go and change a license. You can go click on a program in question here. Never mind, it's saying uninstall or repair. It will sometimes say change. It allows you to go and change something like a license. If you, for some weird reason, need to go and change the license to a program. Maybe the old one has expired. Whatever the case might be. If you happen to have a program and you have a suspicion is corrupt and you want to go and try and repair it, well, this is the place to go and do it, guys. Normally, if you're just going to go and launch the setup file of the program, it's going to try and reinstall it. Or it's going to tell you this program is already installed and nothing's going to happen. Um, so one option you can go and do, besides uninstalling the program, just simply doing a clean install, which would be my recommendation actually, is to go select the program from here, click on repair, and then to have it repair it from itself from there. 
Right, and then guys, here we've got something called enabling and disabling Windows features. Now, if you're wondering where to find this, on that very same screenshot I showed you guys just a moment ago of the add and remove programs, on that very same page, this is where you'll find this button. So on that very same page, top left, there's a button that says turn off and on Windows features, just in case you're wondering. Here's a bit of a screenshot of what it looks like. Now guys, what you'll see in this list is not gonna be the same for all versions and editions of Windows. It depends on the version you're running, it depends on the edition you're running, and um, quite frankly, you might not even have permission to come in here if you're, not, if you're not an administrator or if you don't have the right privilege. So just something to keep in mind. Now, the higher tier your Windows version and edition is, the more you're gonna see in this list. If you eventually come into this list, you'll notice the majority of the boxes listed in this list is actually unticked. That means that component is not turned on or it's not enabled. So you need to go and enable or turn on the function or the feature or the benefit that you actually want. A lot of these are pretty nifty goodies and features and Microsoft does not install them automatically or turn them on automatically. Why, you might ask? Well, guys, if Microsoft had to go and turn on or install all these features by default, the actual Windows installation that you guys are so familiar with, assuming you've actually ever seen it, that's going to take a heck of a lot longer than what it's currently taking. So at the moment, if you try to install Windows 10 or 11 on a machine, you know, assuming it's via flash drive or a DVD or something, or something in that regard, it takes somewhere between 10 minutes and 20 minutes on average. Yes, it could take less. Yes, it could take longer. But on average, between 10 and 20 minutes. Now, if all of these features had to be installed by default, the installation would absolutely not take just 10 or 20 minutes. It would take maybe an hour or two hours. Now, think about that for a moment. Is it fair to punish the average Joe that's trying to install Windows if 99% of people are never going to use anything in this list? Not very fair, is it? So instead, Microsoft decided, you know what? What if we do include it, but we don't actually install it? It's just in a compressed dormant format. And then if you happen to be the 1% or less of the people that actually needs that function or feature, you can simply just go and turn it on. It's going to uncompress itself and it's going to go and install itself. So it is there. It's just in a dormant compressed format. And never mind the installation going quicker, your installation will be smaller, guys. So if you look at something like Windows 10, the default installation size for Windows 10 is about 16 gigs for the 32-bit operating system and 20 gigs for the 64-bit operating system. Now that alone is a lot. And if all these features had to be installed by default, I can assure you now that installation would absolutely not just be 16 or 20 gigs. It'll be a heck of a lot more. I mean, it could be up to 40 gigs, 50 gigs, or even more. Once again, same situation. Is it worth it? to punish the average Joe that's trying to install Windows with this thing taking up so much space of their hard drive if they're never even going to use most of these features. Not exactly fair. So for that reason as well, Microsoft decided, you know what, let's just put this in a compressed dormant format and for the folks that need it, they can just go and turn it on and then obviously it's going to just go and add that. You're going to see it's, look, it's going to look like a Windows update is taking place in some cases. If you're trying to install something like Hyper-V, you can see it's ticked there. That's for virtual machines and all that. It's turned off by default. So if you tick that box, you click on OK, it's going to look like an installation starting on a machine, a normal, normal, everyday installation. Very shortly, you're going to see the machine is going to want to restart. And once it restarts, it's going to look like a Windows update is taking place. Except it's not really technically a Windows update since it was actually already on the machine. It's just uncompressing and installing whatever you clicked on. And that's a little bit about turning features on and off, guys. All right, and then guys, we've got managing software licensing, something I did briefly touch on earlier in this video. So if you don't have a license, chances are you might not be able to use certain softwares. If you do have a license, there's a chance it might only be for a limited period. Maybe you can only use this software for like a year, perhaps, I've seen that. So it might be a yearly subscription kind of license deal, or you just pay for it and you only get it for like a year, then you have to go buy a new one. I know for a while back, antiviruses was quite like that. Not sure if that's still the, the, the case because I'm using Windows Defender, which is completely for free. But generally speaking, if you buy a license for a software, then you would normally have lifetime access. The question is though, that software you bought, even if it is lifetime access, will it always be relevant? Because you know the developers are constantly releasing newer and better versions of software, which means your old software, which you have a lifetime license for, might no longer be relevant. Sucks, right? 
anyway so with regards to software licensing uh, you've got end user license agreement so if most softwares whether it's free or not generally there's some sort of end user license agreement you've got to agree to you'll see often it's just referred to as EULA EULA obviously being short for end user license agreement basically you've got to agree to this agreement before you can use the software and in that agreement you agree that you will not go and use and abuse the software there is sell it for profit you know i mean maybe you paid for one license now you want to go and resell that software copy of yours to five other people for even more so you don't you're not going to go and fire it or crack the software you're going to use it strictly for what it was meant for and you're only going to use it for yourself assuming it's a license for per user kind of situation and that brings me to single use license so single use license is a bit of a wide net that's being thrown here generally it means you can only use that license once uh, sometimes it could mean this license can only be used by one person at a time but he or she can go and use it multiple times uh, as long as they only as long as it's only one person at a time using it but generally when they say single use license it means you can only use it once and even if it's the same device and the same user and you want to go and use it again you'll find often it might not be possible this was actually quite a few times the case with Windows operating systems, mind you. So up until not too long ago, well, I'm saying not too long ago, but it's actually been a long ago. You used to be able to buy a Windows operating system. It'll come with a product key or a license key, and you can go and format a machine of yours as many times as you like, as long as you just retain that legal license of yours. You can always just go and reuse your legal license. Quite useful if you've got a pesky virus you want to get rid of. And then recently it started happening where They'll give you a Windows operating system. So maybe I spend an X amount. I'm just going to thumb suck it here and say I'm going to spend a thousand bucks. Could be more, could be less. I spend a thousand bucks on an operating system, but it only allows me to install it five times. So if I need to go and format, I can only format four or five times. In other words, reload my operating system four or five times. And if I want to do it a sixth time or a seventh time, or any times more than that, you're going to have to go and buy a new copy of Windows. I mean, that doesn't seem very fair. I mean, you paid for this operating system and then they only allow you to reinstall it a couple of times before you have to go and rebuy the exact same thing. Doesn't feel very fair to me. When you've got registration, not something I see often, but some softwares these days do require you to go and register it. So you already bought it, you already paid for it. Um, but as soon as you want to start using it, they're going to ask you for your name, your last name, possibly your residential address and all kinds of other private information from you. And this is so that in case you go and get up to some sort of shenanigans or in case you go and fire the crack the software, they can see who the culprit is. It's also in the event of someone just trying to steal your software. Maybe you're completely innocent. And if someone tries to steal your software, they can see who it's actually legally registered to. You'll find this happens more and more these days, not just of software. Even if you try and use certain appliances and what have you, if you go and, for example, buy yourself a new TV, maybe it's a Samsung TV. I know Samsungs do that. It's just an example. If you buy yourself a new Samsung TV or some other brand, you'll find it's going to ask you to register this TV with Samsung. You have to type in your name, your last name, all kinds of things like that. So that could be for many reasons. Could be to prevent piracy, could be to prevent theft. We'll never know, I suppose. And then the last thing I want to mention here on the software licensing post is subscription versus one-time purchase. So one-time purchase, let's start at that one first. That's the older way of doing things. You buy software, you pay for it once, and then generally you'll have a lifetime access. Or at the very least, you'll have access to for it like, let's say, a year. You know, like an antivirus. Some antiviruses, you buy it, you pay for it once, and it's like a year-long license. And after the year, it comes to an end. You've got to go buy another one-year license then, perhaps. Subscription, on the other hand, is what most of us are doing these days. I'm not talking about a streaming service subscription, guys, because I know all of you guys are watching things like Netflix and Disney Plus and Amazon Prime and what have you. So we're not talking about that kind of subscription, although it does work kind of in the same concept in a, in the sense of payment. Normally, it's a monthly payment. You pay a monthly fee, and in exchange, you will get use of this service, which is a streaming service, which is not the actual example here, or you'll get use of this software. Software as a service is actually a very good example of this, guys. Form Cloud is a very good example in general, specifically software as a service. So normally you, your client, or your client's company, or your company would be paying a monthly fee 
And this is the ex in exchange for the monthly use of that software. Every month, you've got to pay that subscription fee. Failing to do so, you will no longer have access to that software. There's benefits to this, drawbacks to this. Generally, the benefits is, since most of these softwares are cloud-based, you will generally have the latest of the latest and the most up-to-date version always. You don't have to go and worry about buying a newer version or upgrading later down the line. Nope. As long as you pay your subscription, you will always have access and you'll always have access to the latest version. They'll always automatically upgrade you. I mean, you got to love that, right? It's really convenient, I must say. All right, guys, still on the topic of software, shareware, freeware, and open source. Now, depending if you guys watch the whole video or not, this might sound familiar to you guys. We did talk about this earlier. So starting with shareware, what is that? That is a term that doesn't get thrown around a lot, guys. So shareware, all of you guys might have experienced this to a certain degree, just didn't know it. This can be installed for free. So if you've got software which can be installed for free, but there's a catch to it when it comes to this kind of software. Even though it might be installed for free, that's normally a trick to get you to install it, to start liking it. And then once you start liking it and you start using it, you come to the conclusion that, oh, you know what? I've got to buy it. So in other words, what I'm saying is this is a trial. So this is normally online found as a trial. So if you find some sort of game or software, in this case, we're talking about software. Maybe it's awesome software. You love it. You like it. It does exactly what you want to do. And when you realize, oh, dear me, this is only for 30 days. So that's a trial. In other words, shareware. So you can install it for free, but it's generally a catch with shareware. So it's usually a trial, but this trial can be in more than one form, guys. Generally, you'll find this as a 30-day trial. You can only use it for a limited period of time. In other words, 30 days. But I have seen other forms of shareware where there's maybe not a time limit to it, but a usage limit to it. So you can use the software completely to its full extent, but you can only do it like two or three times and then it's going to lock you out. Or it will allow you to use the software, but it's not going to allow you to use the whole software. You're only going to have access to certain functions and features in the software where other ones might still be locked until you buy the full version of the software. So that's different versions of trials, basically. I've, give you guys, I've given you guys three different versions. Then as for freeware, it is completely free software, which is what we want. Unfortunately, generally, when stuff is completely for free, there's a catch. It's probably because it sucks. Not always. I mean, I've seen some pretty nifty software out there that's completely for free. But from my experience, if something is for free, you should question it. There's probably a reason for it. So freeware, guys, is software which is completely free. Then we've got open source. So with open source, the program code, which was used to develop the program by the developers, it's made available to the public, guys. So if you go and get yourself an open source program, you'll find sometimes you pay for it, sometimes not. Generally, they'll be for free from what I've seen. Um, so when you use this program, you'll have access to the source code and you can even go and tweak it and change it any way you like. And this is completely legal. It's allowed by the developer. That's why they made it open source. Believe it or not, there's actually even operating systems which are completely open source. So you'll have access to the operating system and you can go and fiddle the code, change it any way you like. Completely legal to go and do that. Interesting, don't you think? All right, and then moving on to the next one here, productivity software. What is that? Now, some of you guys probably know what this is, even if you're not in IT because your boss might have mentioned it. Some of your colleagues at work might have mentioned it if you're in a different field. So productivity software, guys, for the most part, is what the average Joe would use to get their work done. And this is now, once again, not for people that's necessarily in IT. It would be things like, for example, like a web browser. You know, obviously, we know we get many, many kinds of web browsers. You get Mozilla Firefox, you get Google's Chrome browser, you get Safari, you get Opera, you get Microsoft's Edge browser, you get Microsoft's Internet Explorer. There's even a new browser from Microsoft called Chromium, if I'm not mistaken. So there's, there's quite a lot to go and choose from, guys. And I didn't even mention them all. But effectively, that's what you or the user would go and use to browse the internet, to load web pages, and do whatever you would do normally on the internet. So that's a productivity software, since almost everybody we know these days needs to work online. Then you also get your general word processing software. So this could be something like Microsoft Word. Keep in mind, not limited to Microsoft Word. It is something like Microsoft Word. Obviously, that includes Microsoft Word. So we can go and do all kinds of things in there. 
This could be spreadsheet software. And this once again could be something like Microsoft's Excel, not limiting it to Microsoft's Excel. I'm just giving you guys examples that most people are familiar with. And you get presentation software, you know, once again, from the Microsoft size, this will probably be PowerPoint. Strange enough, I'm giving you guys a lot of Microsoft examples today, but coincidentally, a lot of these things, you know, when it comes to productivity software, forms part of the Office Suite. If any of you guys know what the Office Suite is, so that includes things like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, that kinds of stuff. It's part of Microsoft Office. And this is actually available as software as a service, mind you, if you have a 365 license. So that is what productivity software is. It's what allows you or the users to get their work done in a nutshell from a day-to-day -day basis. And then, folks, the last topic for today, and once we finish this, don't disappear on me yet. There's a couple of things I want to mention. So the last topic, collaboration software. So this is software which is not just for you to do your work per se. I mean, it can be used for that, could not be used for that, but generally it is used for that. It's mainly software which allows you to collaborate with other people, most likely your co-workers and your colleagues and that kinds of stuff. So this includes, but it's not limited to things like your conventional email. So I can send email to people inside my company, outside my company, and we can communicate and we can send documents. That's the point. It includes, but it's not limited to things like online workspaces, document storage, sharing. So guys, online workspaces, this can be a lot of things. If I have to thumb suck and give you an example, this could be something like Microsoft SharePoint environment. Not limited to that. You get lots of online spaces, which are not Microsoft. But a Microsoft SharePoint will probably be a very good example of that. Storage, that could be something like Azure, could be something like AWS, could be OneDrive, could be, uh, what's these other ones you get these days? Not OneDrive, Google Drive, I think is one of them, and uh, quite a few other ones. Same with sharing, you can use those exact same platforms, the sharing that I just mentioned. And then you get remote desktop and screen sharing. So remote desktop could be used to go and see what someone is doing. This could be because they want to show you something. It could be because you want to go and troubleshoot something. Or it could just in general be because you need to go and take control of a machine. And that machine could have someone there. Or it could be a completely unattended machine, like a server. So technicians, guys, in case you don't know, very, very often use remote desktop to remote desktop into a server. And then we see everything on that server without actually having to walk to that server. And that means it's a form of remote connectivity. Basically is what it is. So I can control that machine without having to walk up to that machine. I've had cases, guys, where the technician would be in their own office and that office would literally be right next to the server room and they'll refuse to walk into the server room and they'll go and remote desktop into the server room because why not? In the server room, it's hot or it's cold or it's noisy, where in their office, it might be nice and comfortable on their chair. You know, so why not remote desktop? Screen sharing allows you and the user to see the same thing at the same time. So remote desktop, not necessarily. So remote desktop, if I remote desktop into your computer right now, it's going to kick you out to the logon screen where you have to go and type in your password. And if you type in your password and you log back in, it'll kick me out and vice versa. Screen sharing, on the other hand, guys, this is where I can see everything on your machine and you can see it at the same time. So if I'm connecting to you, you can see the screen, and I can see the screen. Unlike remote desktop, but only one person at a time can do it without kicking the other one out. Screen sharing, not so much. You get many, many forms of screen sharing. You get TeamViewer. I think you get something called VNC. There's AnyDesk. And there's many other ones I can give you guys. So it's not software that comes with your computer. You're going to have to go and download it. You get free versions. You get paid versions. But generally, they work in the same way. So if I want to connect to your machine, you're going to have to open that software first. There's a code you're going to have to read to me. And there's a password you can have to read to me, and that's going to allow me to connect to your machine. Now, the code is basically your computer's ID. That doesn't normally change. It's the password that changes every time you open a software, in case I want to try and connect to your machine without your permission. So every time I want to go and connect to your machine, you're going to have to give me the new password first. So it's not as unsecure as some people might think. Then, guys, as for collaboration software, we also get instant messaging software. Nowadays, this is incorporated into almost everything. So this is incorporated into things like Zoom, into Microsoft Teams. It has been incorporated into other softwares in the past, like Microsoft Skype for Business, Microsoft Link. And then if you go further back in time, you can find this on Yahoo Messenger, Hotmail Messenger. We had good old school Skype, just normal Skype, not Skype for Business, and many, many, many other platforms as well. 
So instant messaging, which is known as IM, is where I can go and add someone and I can go and talk to them via text messaging. And if you're really lucky, some of these instant messaging platforms could also allow you to call them, not all of them. Some of them allowed webcams, some of them didn't. And that brings me to the last collaboration software here, which is video conferencing software. I accidentally mentioned some of them just now. That would be things like Microsoft Teams nowadays or something like Zoom nowadays. I think those are probably the two most popular ones. Obviously, there's other ones out there on the market, but those two are the two most popular ones on the market that I'm aware of. All right, folks, can you believe it? We've made it to the end of Module 2. Thankfully, this one is not as long as Module 1. Thank goodness, because I'm out of breath. Guys, do me a favor. If you haven't done it already, give this video a like so I can get it in front of more people. And that way I can help more people out there that cannot afford training material. And if you enjoy this module, maybe consider subscribing. At least then Module 3 will pop up on your screen as well if it comes out. And guys, a special shout out and thank you to everybody that's sponsoring this channel. So if you are a Patreon sponsor, thank you very much. PayPal sponsors, thank you very much. For those of you clicking on the thanks button below the video, thank you. And um, just in general, making donations. If you guys want to become a sponsor as well, you or you just want to donate, you can find all of that in the video description down below as well. Here's a screen of all the Patreon sponsors. Guys, once again, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Here's a screen of the PayPal sponsors. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. And then lastly, guys, before we conclude this video, in case you don't know, there's a Discord server that I have. It's called Free IT Training. And on that server, you'll find not just me, but many, many other people that are studying this course along with many other IT courses. So it's got more than a thousand people in it the last time I checked. I think it's probably a heck of a lot more now. It's completely free. Link is literally the very, very bottom link at the, in the video description. So if you scroll all the way down in the video description, it's going to be the very, very last link. There you'll find my Discord server link if you know what Discord server is. There's lots of other people in there that are experts in the community. So if you've got a question regarding the exam, regarding the course, or you know you just want maybe people that's like-minded, you can go there, have a chat, ask your questions. Either myself or someone will answer your question. And if you happen to be pretty clued up in something in IT, maybe you can provide assistance to someone else who's got a question there. Like I said, it's a community of like-minded people. It's completely free. It's called free IT training. It's to provide free resources to people that need it. At the end of the day, I don't like charging money for anything. Right, folks, I hope you've enjoyed this module. I shall see you in module three of the CompTIA ITF Plus course, or should I say IT Fundamentals course. Bye, guys.